welcome to Arbitral Insights, a podcast series brought to you by our international arbitration practice lawyers here at Reed Smith. I'm Peter Rocher, Global Head of Reed Smith's International Arbitration Practice. I hope you enjoy the industry commentary, insights and anecdotes we share with you in the course of this series, wherever in the world you are. If you have any questions about any of the topics discussed, please do contact our speakers. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of Arbitral Insights. I'm Peter Rusher, Global Chair of Reed Smith's International Arbitration Practice. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by a Reed Smith partner, Sophie Goosens, and independent arbitrator and co-founder of ArbTech, Sophie Neppert. So welcome to both of you. Today's discussion will explore international arbitration and the metaverse. Before we get started, just a few words about each of our speakers. Sophie Goosens is one of my partners in our entertainment and media industry group based in London, although Sophie goes between London and Paris. She's a member of Reed Smith's crypto and digital assets group, and her practice focuses on all issues shaping the future of the media issue from a technological, commercial, legal and policy making standpoint. Sophie Nappert is an arbitrator in independent practice. And Sophie is a pioneering practitioner at the intersection of arbitration and legal tech. In 2019, Sophie completed the University of Oxford Said Business School program on blockchain strategy. And in 2021, she co-founded ArbTech, which is a worldwide online community forum focusing and fostering cross-disciplinary dialogue on technology dispute resolution and the future of justice. So we're in very good hands to talk about this topic, metaverse. A buzzword, something that we've all, I'm sure, been hearing a lot about over the last few months, both metaverse and Web3. Uh, So perhaps a good place to start is if I ask, and I'll put this question first to Sophie Goosens, I mean, if you could perhaps just explain what metaverse is and or Web3. Yes, thank you, Peter. That's indeed a, a, a question that keeps being asked. Not that there is any definitive definition for each of these concepts. But generally speaking, when one is talking about a metaverse, it is by reference to an environment that is virtual. So think about just playing a video game, you'd be in a metaverse. Entering a virtual world, you'd be in a metaverse. Putting a VR headset on and entering an artificial world, you would be in another metaverse. Recently, there's another buzzword and another concept that goes hand in hand with the metaverse that is being discussed, and that's the concept of Web3. Generally, Web3 refers to a decentralized internet. Every application that is being built, leveraging blockchain technology, and also what is called a DAO. A DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization, which is also uh, running on the blockchain. And the applications that are being built, leveraging blockchain technology and leveraging these DAOs are referred to as Web3 by contrast with Web1, which was a good old World Wide Web as we knew it in the late 90s, or Web2, which is the iteration of the internet, which gave birth to user-generated content and social media. I think that that's where I'll stop by way of an introduction for these two concepts. Perhaps if I ask Sophie Napper, if you have any thoughts on that, and particularly in relation to this decentralizing of DAO. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you for, for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to speak about uh, my, my pet topic at the moment. And yes, I do have some thoughts. One of the things that I find fascinating at, in this field at the intersection of the law and the law of disputes, which is what I know, and technology is that uh, there are as many practical areas of interest and challenges as there are uh, metaphysical areas of, of interest and, and challenges. One of them is the point that Sophie made, uh, which is uh, very, it, it sounds obvious, but it's very important. It is that these worlds are artificial, completely made up. They are virtual. And that means that they upend things that are the very center of what you do as a disputes lawyer or as an arbitrator. 
And that is the, the question of trust and the question of why and how you refer disputes to a certain platform or, or uh, system. And in an artificial world where you are avatared and anonymous, your relationship to other human beings is completely different to that which it is in, in, in the physical world. So when one starts speaking about how do you bring justice or dispute resolution within an environment such as this, one has to start from these very basic premises in order to understand what the users want. On Web3, I, I would say quite interestingly that the mantra of decentralization is being, it's obviously what is underpinning blockchain and what is at the center of this boom. Whether it will remain that way is not something that should be taken for granted, much like what happened at the very beginning of the internet, where it was meant to be a free space for the unregulated exchange of, of everything without hinders and, and without centralization of platforms. It is thought that Web3 may be going into that direction precisely for the reason to garner the trust of users, that users may, no matter what they, they, they might be saying when they jump on the platforms at first, when the stakes are high and they invest quite a lot of money or when they have a dispute, they may well welcome a, a central sort of authority or manager or organizer to, to be able to say, well, this is the way that things are going to work. I don't have a view on this particularly myself. I would say it's probably human nature that tends to go in that direction. We have also obviously been burnt by the excesses of, of, of the large tech giants. And so maybe it's, it would be time to learn our lesson that way. I don't think a fully, completely decentralized arena going forward is, is realistic, but time will tell, I guess. I agree with that. Another question that, that obviously, for those of us practicing in international arbitration, comes immediately to mind is, I mean, what what kind of disputes are likely to arise from or in the metaverse and also in relation to Web3? I mean, if I put that question first to Sophie Goosens. I mean, you would have the two different topics would come to mind depending on whether we are looking at your question from the metaverse point of view or Web3 point of view. So if we start with Web3 and this idea of a decentralized internet where not one single entity controls the, the platform that you are on, the, the Web3 has been made possible really by NFTs. So it is the, the rise of the NFT and the adoption of NFT as a concept that is now quasi mainstream, which is fueling the development of, of Web3. At least that's, that's how we see it from, from where I sit, which is what, with my IP, media and technology uh, legal hat on. And, and the, the NFTs really are a fascinating object of law for a lawyer because they are new. And when I say new, I also mean new from a legal perspective. And, and they are taking us aback because it's quite difficult for a lawyer to imagine that a new legal concept can be born out of practice or out of businesses. Normally, we are more used to having legal concepts being adopted by parliaments and legislators. And what is owned, what can be owned, what cannot be owned, is generally something that is decided by the state, by the people that we entrust with making laws in a country. And here we have this concept of digital ownership that has arisen from practice from the the makers of these uh, new forms of ownership and services and i think uh, what we have seen is that the endorsement of certain very well established players has played an enormous role in giving nfts the credentials it needed to develop in the way it has i'm thinking in particular about the NFT sales at Christie's, 
in March 2020 of that work by the artist Beeple that uh, I believe was sold for $69 million. We saw that as a really like um, almost an endorsement which allowed the world of NFTs to completely go crazy after that. But going back to your um, question, Peter, uh, what are the likely disputes that may arise in, in a Web3 environment? This concept of digital ownership is so new, so young, and at, and at the same time, it, it's. I think we need to say at the moment, it's quasi-ownership. I don't know if we can, as lawyers, pretend that we will conflate the ownership that we know today, the one that is, again, deriving from good old legislators and states with this quasi ownership that has been invented and it's enforced by the blockchain. So, so that's a concept that is going to continue to evolve and, and be um, challenged, certainly by NFT minters and, and, and people in that industry. Okay, Sophie Napper, looking at this with your sort of arbitration focus, uh, what kind of disputes would you see? Again, going back to the contextual arena, I would say that what's fascinating for the world of disputes is that in this artificial world, the things that you that you may acquire or that transact between participants are not physical. That is something that places existing legacy systems of arbitration or lawsuits on the back foot completely on many, many levels, as, as you might imagine. The types of dispute, of course, Web3, characteristic of Web3 is that the participants can transact with each other directly, as we're seeing with the real estate and, and NFT boom in the metaverses. And where you, where you have transactions, of course, you are going to have disputes. For the dispute resolution practitioner, the first reflex and a lot of the, of the scholarship or, or writings that you will see on this topic there is a natural reflex, I guess, to, to try to use what we know about dispute resolution and try to transpose it in this environment or to take disputes that arise in this environment and try to make them decided and enforced outside of the environment. It doesn't work. The interface between the metaverses and, and the world that we practice in is just not at all organized or developed. And frankly, I am not sure that the users of the metaverses will want that. So the disputes that might arise there are, I think, apart from what Sophie has, uh, has outlined, which are completely novel areas and, and very excitingly so, you have obviously the more uh, standard commercial disputes. And you also have challenges. I, I want to talk a little bit very shortly about two pending arbitrations that are not, have not arisen in the metaverse, but have arisen on the blockchain, uh, on the Binance platform, which is a crypto trading platform. One of them, I think, is in, on the verge of being started. The other one is afoot in two separate institutions. One is the ICC. The other one is the uh, Hong Kong International Operations Center, which were the institutions named in the terms of use of Binance. The crypto traders claim that the Binance platform shut down unexpectedly at a very volatile time and that they, some of them, lost millions of, of dollars uh, because they couldn't close their position. And so the first challenge, of course, is who do you sue? Who are the respondents? Who is, because the Binance entities, the corporate entities that, that are Binance, in, if you read the terms of use carefully, disclaim any, any liability or, or link with the operation of the platform. So it is a very that is a very basic question and a very difficult one. And of course, the liability of any platform provider, their terms of use are you know, riddled with paragraphs and capital letters disclaiming any liability. And that crypto trading is a game where essentially buyer beware and very much taking your own risks. And so it's going to be fascinating, I think, to see these tested in standard arbitration and to see whether they're... Again, law in the making, there is going to be. So I can see something very similar in the metaverse. Again, the challenge of anonymity and the challenge. I mean, I don't think there's so much a challenge of enforcement if everything remains on chain, but definitely a challenge of, you know, how you go about identifying who you should sue, who you should pursue, who you should claim against. I mean, you mentioned one difference, which will be the anonymity. Sophie Goosens, I mean, how how do you think these will be different from disputes as we as we know them? 
I don't know if there will be a massive difference or if there will be a the the challenges that we have seen arising from just the internet are just going to be magnified and even even more challenging than before. To go back to what Sophie was saying a few minutes ago, I think that's a point that is that was very well made and that I I, I resonated with me as a, as an IP lawyer is the the fact that if we're looking now at the metaverse, so us entering into virtual worlds and transacting within those worlds, buying virtual land and all of the all of that we see happening at the moment in, in Decentraland or in the sandbox or other metaverses uh, that are quite popular these days, we are within a world that is entirely manufactured. That means that somewhere, someone designed every virtual tree, every virtual cloud, every little bird in the sky, the clothes that your avatar will be wearing, the car that your avatar will be driving, all of that has been designed by someone and therefore is likely to attract IP protection or copyright protection. And the way we, so, you know, whether it's a centralized metaverse with a central entity behind that, that you can identify as the IP holder, or whether it's a decentralized metaverse where uh, potentially it's more difficult or going to be more difficult to identify who the uh, rights holders are. In any case, you are going to be probably going to come up against a lot of IP-based litigation just because of the fact that there is so much IP surrounding you everywhere you look. And a problem that has been recurring in the world of online IP is just to try and understand where is the internet. And that is something that a lot of law professors and academics in the field of copyright have written about. It is a recurring problem of both the the international private law and copyright law, and how do you marry those two with something like the internet? And, And how do you respond to that question so because as we all know where is the internet also means where do i sue and who is competent to hear that dispute so as of today there's a there's a huge challenge that we have not resolved which is the territoriality of the law versus the globality of the internet and 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 we are still in a world where it's it's quite difficult to not only to guide our clients when they come to us with a with a copyright dispute happening online, but also it can be very frustrating for everyone, but probably for rights holders in the first place, to hear that there is still an element of a country by country scenario that you can't really deal with the globality of the problem by going to one place. And, and it's still a bit of a, a, a jigsaw. I saw very recently that Nike is suing a uh, a reseller, online reseller of its sneakers over an NFT that they had put on their website in the the US courts and I I thought that would be probably some uh, the sort of of claim that will test a lot of what Sophie has been has been mentioning. Yeah. I mean, one other thing that just uh, just occurs to me hearing this, I mean, more one it's going to be a real shift in mindset and it really is quite a minefield, but from a due process point of view, and this this will be for Sophie Nappert. I mean, do, do you see there being some real issues there? To me, this is an absolute game changer. I and not only will will it have to uh, will we have to look at at you know revisiting what due process means in the blockchain disputes, but it's going to I think filter into due process as we understand them in legacy arbitration. I mean. We have talked about this now during this podcast. These are transactions between people who do not know each other that are often one-off, that are immediately enforceable. The users will want to have a system that matches these values. The system that we know of due process is time-heavy, document-heavy, witness-evidence-heavy, all of this. You cannot have a dispute resolution that lasts more than a few hours a day, a couple of days at most. It just does not fit with what's going on in in that world and the values of the users of that world. And again, they will not trust a dispute resolution system that does not deliver 
in the in in the time the sort of the, the notion of time that exists in the metaverses so to me and, and to me that this is very exciting because for once here we have a blank slate of devising a dispute resolution system from scratch and we can finally uh, put to rest the time and costs the issues that have been plaguing us for ages that everyone's written about and talks about at conferences but that really have not been solved and so my my thinking is that some serious thought has to be given to what is due process and what ends does it serve. And I've heard on Arctic we have interviewed in-house legal counsel in large corporations who have said for certain types of disputes we're willing to trade off what you know the sacrosanct due process for a result that is fair enough and but but is quick and is cheap and we can carry on you know doing the business that we do. Wow. Well, that sort of segues into a question that I'll put first to Sophie Goosens, and that's, Sophie, what, what dispute resolution mechanisms do you think could or should be applicable? I mean, there's so much discussion about what smart contracts can achieve. So smart contracts, uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to try to give a definition, uh, although I'm sure Sophie and Napier would would probably complete it. They are just a piece of code that can execute some instructions which might be of a contractual nature. So that that can be as, as simple as at the end of this time, please lock this. So the, the virtual car you're driving, you will, might not be able to drive it anymore at the end of a certain period of time. That would be the end of your lease contract. And the smart contract would self-execute and, and you would be expulsed or your avatar would be asked to to get out of that car i mean th- that's what a very simple or simplistic explanation of what a smart contract can do there's a lot of work being done at the moment on smart contracts how can they be leveraged and also how can we as lawyers try to draft some of our contracts in a way that they can be translated into instructions into code and how can we leverage that as a tool to assist our clients so that they can save all that time? And exactly to the point that Sophie was making earlier, there is a real appetite for uh, a lot of these certain simple disputes or low value disputes to get them to be automated. And the automation of the dispute could very well be connected with this smart contract evolution and, and how do we uh, marry the two to get to a, a system that is fast, efficient, but continues to be trusted by the people that are using it. On the, 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 the blockchain side of things, and I'll put this to Sophie Napper, do you think there are any particular issues there in this context? So there are at the moment some applications that sit on the Ethereum blockchain offering dispute resolution services. You have to be a little bit careful in this field. They use words that have very specific legal meanings and that make lawyers jump. Uh, it's not arbitration. And it and a smart contract is not a contract. As Sophie was explaining, it's a piece of code that automates uh, the performance of the contract. So they call it blockchain arbitration. It is blockchain dispute resolution by its peer-to-peer dispute resolution. And What's very interesting about these applications, they are experimental, but what's very interesting about them is the way that those jurors are incentivized to decide as a consensus in in the same manner. They are financially incentivized to do so. And what's also very interesting about these dispute resolution mechanisms is that they are targeting e-commerce disputes, crypto disputes, the sort of disputes that go completely under the radar of what you and I do, Peter, and what the state courts even do. And and there's a classic disruption pattern, right? They start with a very small slice of the pie. And if the users, if the marketplace adopts them and has trust in them, again, we come back to the question of trust, very important, it will that that slice of pie will will get bigger. One of those applications, I think probably the front runner at the moment is called Kleros. K-L-E-R-O-S, uh, and they use game theory uh, mechanisms to incentivize their jurors who are Tom the Canary on the blockchain staking a token in order to be chosen algorithmically to decide a dispute. So 
you don't need me to tell you that due process in, <laughs> in this arena is very basic indeed. I mean, they do have a form of, you know, evidence submission and so on, but it is, it is not at all the standard that you expect. But again, the users don't mind. The users find it, they, they, they trust their peers. They trust their peers more than they would trust a centralized court. And on the whole, the decisions, they are very binary disputes. The decisions are fair enough. Again, that's, uh, that's, that's what we have to grapple with, I think, going forward. Okay, well, that leads very nicely to, and it'll be my final sort of question to you both. I mean, do you, could arbitration proceedings take place in the metaverse? I don't see why not. Again, with the caveat that they, they're going to need a serious dusting off. And again, I wouldn't be surprised, <laughs> given that we have Sotheby's and Christie's with a uh, and even banks, as I understand, are setting up in the metaverse. Why not an arbitration institution, indeed? But I think you need those rules to be pared down and to reflect, again, the values of the users. And that needs, yeah, serious pair of eyes. Well, I, I think that we will be following up on this podcast because clearly um, there's plenty of material going forward and just to, to watch the evolution. So it just remains, I'm looking at timing now, to thank both of you very much indeed for sharing your views, your thoughts and insights. This has been fascinating. And as I say, it's clearly an area to watch very closely. So thank you both. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks. Arbitral Insights is a Reed Smith production. Our producer is Ali McArdle. For more information about Reed Smith's global international arbitration practice, email arbitralinsights at reedsmith.com. To learn about the Reed Smith Arbitration Pricing Calculator, a first-of-its-kind mobile app that forecasts the cost of arbitration around the world, search Arbitration Pricing Calculator on reedsmith.com or download for free through the Apple and Google Play app stores. You can find our podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google Play, Stitcher, ReadSmith.com, and our social media accounts at ReadSmith LLP on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is provided for educational purposes. It does not constitute legal advice and is not intended to establish an attorney-client relationship, nor is it intended to suggest or establish standards of care applicable to particular lawyers in any given situation. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Any views, opinions, or comments made by any external guest speaker are not to be attributed to Reed Smith LLP or its individual lawyers. All rights reserved.